All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last official lecture for Comp 1511. I should say it's the last official lecture because I've just been talking to Tom about what activities we schedule for next week, Stuvac. And we're thinking um, revision some things, revision classes, revision lectures, revision sessions, Tuesday and Wednesday, probably in the afternoon. Uh, if that, there's something that might not suit a lot of students about that, get back to us. I know a lot of you got maths exams Friday, so we don't want to use Thursday because you'll be busy studying for maths. But we're thinking maybe sessions on Tuesday, revision sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday. All right. Tom is also telling me to remind you about weekly tests. Where are we with weekly tests? Uh, our weekly test from last week is due very shortly, in a few hours. So if you haven't done that, you need to do it as soon as this lecture finishes. I think the official due time is 5 o'clock. I can never remember. Is it 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock? I, I think it's 8 o'clock. Oh, it's 8 o'clock. So you've got heaps of time. You've got a whole six hours from now to finish last week's weekly test. Uh, and I guess that is worth reminding you because we're always busy with the assignment. The assignment is also due very soon. It's due at 8 o'clock tomorrow. So let's be clear about that. 8 o'clock Sydney time tomorrow. Assignment 2. It's an important thing is due. I'll go back to the assignment, but weekly test that there, there is one more weekly test. So there's a weekly test that's going to be released fairly soon. It'll be out before tomorrow, probably this evening, um, which will be due in Stuvac. So, I mean, it's a one hour thing. It's a good example. In fact, it's not, not weekly tests are designed to be exam preparation, but we've, we've specially tailored this one to be exactly exam preparation. So this, so part of your Stuvac exam preparation will be do the week 10 weekly tests. We'll send you an email so you don't forget. All right, the assignment's due 8 o'clock tomorrow, and we have help sessions running after this lecture and tomorrow for those who need it, help sessions. And the forum is busy, busy, busy with all sorts of good questions about the assignment. So I guess a couple of things, three things I'd say before asking a question in the forum. One would be, please read through the forum, scan through the forum, and see if someone's already asked the question. It's not a bad thing to be doing anyway, because someone can have asked a good question there, and the explanation might help you anyway. So there might be a different topic that there's a question for that the answer sort of helps you with the assignment. But before you ask a question, scan, scan back through the questions and see if someone's asked this question beforehand. The second would be, give us all the information we need to give you a good answer. Help us out. So tell us all you can about you know, what the problem is, what the output is, and what you've tried, and so on. So ask a good question. Well, I guess the third thing I was thinking of was, yeah, just don't leave things out. The classic thing is students send us a screenshot, and sort of two lines out of the screenshot is the compile command, or the bit of output that we wanted to see that really would give us the clue about what the bug is. So give us everything we need to know to help you answer questions. Um, two shout outs here. One would be to the tutors. There's a whole set of tutors have been coming in and out of the forum answering questions. So Shrey's had major commitments and other tutors have been rotating in and out. I've lost track of who's answering. I saw some great answers from Tam, but there's all been all sorts of tutors coming in and out. So a big thank you to all the tutors that do that. Um, if you're doing well in this course, think about coming back next year maybe to be one of those tutors uh, but a big th and I'm already seeing some people are answering questions in some students are answering questions in forums and doing a great job of communicating helpful information to their fellow students so a uh, thank you to you um, so will we have help sessions next week uh, we will have some sort of sessions next week so we'll have revision sessions I'm not sure whether we call them help sessions because that, what you're doing next week is less targeted but we will have opportunities for you to get help next week We'll, we'll put those details in the um, in the announcement that we send out tonight as we send out the weekly tests. I've got some plans of exactly what we'll do, but I'll run them past Andrew and some tutors and we'll get something formed so you can all know what we're doing next week. Monitor your email as well. It's quite possible that Monday we'll decide, oh, we need something extra as well. So uh, you monitor your email or ask in the forum and yeah, we can see what we can do. 
All right. Yeah, the week big 10 test, week 10 test, not out yet. Tom says he's going to have it out this evening. But I'm, I mean, I'm betting. Press the button on it. But anyway, you've got an assignment to do. And so you should be, do the assignment, relax, well, maybe switch to working on other courses, get your assignment in tomorrow, switch to working on other courses, and then come back to the week 10 weekly test, maybe Monday, Sunday or Monday probably. All right. Um, what else is happening in the course that I need to remind students about, Tom? Uh, this is the last lecture. People will be having their last labs tomorrow. So I think the only other thing is the fact that the exam is on the 18th of August. I'm just going to double check that number. I'm almost certain I'm correct. Yes, so Wednesday the 18th of August. Uh, the exam will start at 1 p.m. It will run for six hours. As we said yesterday, we'll probably have some Q&A about the exam now, I'd imagine. But um, just remember, it's a six-hour exam, but you, you will only need to spend We've sort of designed it to spend around three hours on. We know that some students spend more, some students spend less, but the six hours are just to give you time uh, to, uh, if, if you have a technical difficulty or something like that, it's just so you don't have to stress about it. So to repeat that, the exam is 13 days away, if my arithmetic, um, yeah, it should show in your official UNSW timetable. It's, it's, it's a six hour exam, but don't stress We've designed it to be finishable in much less than six hours. One thing we're worried about is that your know, internets will break or our servers will break or something will break for half an hour. We, we can worry about that much less if you don't have to use every last minute for the exam. So there's a deliberately an hour or two or three of slack built into that exam window there. So I sent you a link to the slides from Tuesday's lecture. Um, we went through a great length about this. If you put questions in the Slack, uh, um, Tom can pass them on to me, or if I don't notice them, and we can ask if we can answer any questions about the exam. Please don't email questions about the exam to me, to your tutor, to anyone. Questions about the exam have to be answered in a public forum. If, if someone emails me and I say, oh, oh yeah, by the way, you know, ask about question two, and I say, yeah, well, by the way, question two in the exam will be a double nested loop involving an array of doubles. It's not really fair to the rest of the class who don't know that that's the case. So any information about the exam, it's really important. We put it somewhere where the whole class can see. What are the places the whole class can see? Uh, lectures and the course forum are the main places. I mean, we, we, if we put prep stuff in tutes, that's also OK, or lab exercises, or weekly tests, that's OK. But anything that's sort of relevant to the exam, we make sure goes in a, in a public place where everyone can see, so no one has any special advantage. So don't email us questions about the exam. Put it in the course forum. Uh, we can rule things out, maybe, or rule things in, or but it has to be somewhere everyone can see, for fairness. All right. So today's lecture, if there's nothing else, no, it doesn't look like there's anything else in the chat. Today's lecture will just recap. Through, we're going to work through the course content, and it, in in some of the revision things like next week, we might get we might get into some specific areas. But let's 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 do a walk through the course. It's actually quite nice because I know you're struggling with. There are really hard concepts that you're dealing with in assignment two. Manipulating changing linked lists, that's the hardest sort of deepest concepts. But there's also this dealing with an ADT, dealing with an interface, which are actually perhaps really portable lessons are being learned there. Even if you go on not to be coding, if you go on to be an engineer dealing with software systems, the, the lessons you're learning from dealing with, with an ADT in Pokedex will actually, actually carry over to a lot of software systems. So that that's really useful stuff beyond the coding, the the basic you know, manipulating pointers and things like that. You're understanding as well. So you're wrestling with really hard stuff. So it's nice to go back through the stuff we have learnt, and we and now seems easy. So let's let's go let's go right back nine weeks ago, back in time, and see what's happening. All right, I should say. This lecture is filled in with I didn't we didn't have a chance to grab memes from this term students I'm sorry your memes might, might get shown to next term students but um, we have got 
memes courtesy i think well no i'm not even sure they're all t1 students some of them might be last year students but we have memes There's courtesy a few from some, last year students but lots of them from this year from lots of this from t1 all right yeah you'd have to agree with I'm, I'm by the way i may have to get tom to explain some of the memes to me but i understand this one all right so and as as do you all yes Though a lot of this, a lot of this I would say is about, and it's not just dealing with computers, it's about the incredible precision of thought and precision of um, statement that, that dealing with a computer takes. And again, this is not just with coding. So you've learned, you've learned those sort of skills, this incredible need to be incredibly pedantic about things. Uh, that will serve you well in, in anything you do dealing with computers. All right, so that's our first meme out of the way. All right, non-meme content. These are the topics through the course. I might work backwards here. So there are two key things. We talked about the exam. And in the exam, you've got to show us that you understand arrays. And you've got to show us you understand linked lists. So on the exam, questions one and three of the second part of the exam where there are eight questions the practical part of the exam so remember we've got 20 short answer questions eight longer answer questions which will ask you to write code 20 short answers that which might be multiple choice or just ask for a number or something really short eight things eight questions where you're asked to write code questions one question three will involve solving a problem using arrays probably filling in a function I'd guess and You've got to show us you understand arrays, and, and if you get to do that, you've either get 50% on question one, and that's where you'll probably do it. But if you've got a blind spot with question one and you get 50% on question three, you're also good. So 50% on question three, fine. 50% on question one, fine. And to, to the person who was searching for a loophole and wanted to get 25% on on both of them, no, no, sorry. I want to see you, you know, a program that's pretty much working on arrays. So that's one key topic. Um, the second key topic is linked lists. And question two and question four will be linked lists. And you've got, also got to demonstrate, in addition, you've got to say, show that you can program with linked lists. Now, these, que question, these won't be the hardest question with linked lists. So we, you've seen that things like deleting from a linked list, modifying a linked list, that's really tricky. So question two will be definitely something that, that's a bit easier than that. It'll be a standard. There'll be both. There'll be standardish linked list questions, and you've got to get 50% on one of those. Right, so 50% on that, and you're happy. So what we're expecting is most students will do it by just getting question one mostly out, completely out. Question two mostly out, completely out, and you're done. You've met the 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 hurdle requirement on the exam. There's also a requirement to score 50% on the course overall, like in the UNSW course. But if you've been working away consistently through the term, that, that shouldn't be a problem for you. All right. So that's a big thing. What do you need? So they're sort of folk. If, you, if, you, if you're worried about passing this course, you're not confident about passing this course, those are your two focuses. What do they require, though? Yeah, they do need a bit more back than let me clear this and start again. So if I want to do arrays, what do I need to know? Well, I, I need to know while statements, if statements, variables, input, output. So they're all crucial things about working with arrays. Now, I'm hoping you look at those. I'm hoping at this point in time you look at, yeah, while statements. I, yeah, I'm, I'm doing those pretty easily. If statements, variables, and so on. So I'm hoping you can feel the sense of achievement. You've understood this stuff and can write programs like that. If so, come along to question one, and you should be writing code, debugging code, auto-testing it, submitting it, and that all should be good. What about linked lists? What do we need to know for linked lists? We need to know about structures, because linked lists use structures. We need to know about pointers. Um, what are, oh, we need to know a bit of, yeah, we need to know, we haven't done a lot on memory. Uh, memory allocation actually has some more complications that we don't get to in this course. But So we need to know how to use malloc to get the memory for a struct. We need to know how to know, manipulate pointers. I guess we need while as well and if. But So 
we've got to, if you work backwards, that's what we need from that. Uh, now, now, is there anything else here? Well, that leaves us with characters and strings and command line arguments. Not crucial to passing the course. Want a good mark on the exam? Yeah, sure, you've got to know those. So not crucial to passing the course. Our functions, I guess, you have to know the basics of functions, I guess, because some of the exam questions one, two, probably ask you to modify a function. So you need to know how a function works. You don't have to do anything particularly clever with a function just to, to get through the exam. If you want to solve some of the later questions, you probably want to be, be able to know how to construct a function, think about what functions are needed, and so on. What does it leave us? Multi-file projects. It's possible one of the later in question exam questions will involve multiple files, but certainly don't need it to get through the exam. Abstract data types, recursion, definitely don't need those to get the exam. That's not to say question seven, question eight couldn't might not might use these. The harder questions on the exam. That's I guess one thing to remind remember in the exam. Question one and two will be sort of basic you know, core competencies, what I call it, standard things that any student who passes Comp 1511 needs to know. The questions get harder and harder and harder down to question eight, where I'm very happy to see you get a HD for the course without solving question eight. Question eight may be so hard that, you know, only a couple of students solve it, and there's students who get 95 plus or something like that. So. There's a real range of difficulty. So don't look at the exam and panic and think, oh my god, I can't do question eight, or I can't exactly see how to do question seven. No, no, no. Start the other way around. By all means, read through the questions. We've all got you've all got good exam technique. That's how you got to this university. So scan through the questions so you have an idea of you know what, what suits you. But it's almost certainly going to be one, two, three, four, and then you might do six and seven or five and but I think carefully but before doing them out of order. We generally are pretty good at getting the orders consistent. Um, one thing that's it's worth noting, by the way, is Andrew is at the moment talking about the eight practical questions, which make up the vast majority of the exam. Um, all of these things that we're talking about here, um, in theory, we could ask questions about them in the theory section. Oh, that's uh, true. So, so, um, so, for instance, when when Andrew is talking about things like. Uh, abstract data types or, or recursion. Uh, certainly those are the sorts of things where if we were going to test them in the actual exam, they'd probably come up close to the end. Uh, and you probably don't even need them to get through uh, the the second part of the exam. Certainly in the first part of the exam, we might ask you a question that needs you to know something about recursion or about those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, that definitely true and a good point. But remember the, at the first part of the exam, each question is only worth one mark. Yes. So and again, and, and, and even there, that, that's going to be a pretty broad survey of the whole course. It's not like, you know, mm. we're going to spend 10 marks of that talking about everything, you know, abstract data types and recursion specifics. It's, sort of, it's going to be a broad look at the whole course. All right. One thing, you, by the way, you can tell is how much time did lectures, labs, tutes spend on a topic? That's, that's sort of a rough measure of how long, how much time you might expect the exam to spend on it. Um, so we covered, we looked at recursion in one lecture. Uh, th that's like an eighteenth of the course. So you might expect an eighteenth of the exam, maybe, maybe not, maybe none. Who knows? It's don't 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 blame me if there's no recursion question. Do blame me uh, if fifty percent of the exam is on recursion. Yeah, that would be very bad. We'll try and avoid that. Um, there are some good questions in the chat, which, if, if it's okay, I might run through. Is that all right, Andrew? That would be fine. Cool. Um, so uh, there's a question about, will, will any marks be awarded if questions seven and eight are attempted and partially co working code is written? Um, so the way that this works is, for every question, um, there is a human marker who will look at your code. Um, and we, we have a, uh, like a marking scheme, effectively, that we can use to um, give you partial marks. So even if your code doesn't compile, even if your code 
doesn't run, there is the possibility that you might get partial marks. Now, I, um, I would say for question eight, we get students who put in effectively printf hello world. They put in a bit of C that could be an answer to any question. That's not yeah. worth any marks. It has to be, you know, getting a third of the way, say, to solving question eight. But it could be a third of the way, not even compile, but it's done something important for question eight, and that's worth marks. Yes, absolutely. Um, the earlier questions are like that too. It's just that we generally find that um, less people get those sort of partial marks in those earlier questions. Certainly seven and eight, though, people will, will definitely get partial marks. Um, and almost certainly more people will get partial marks for question eight than people who will get full marks. Um, there was another question in there, which was, will we get access to style check and auto test to the exam? Absolutely, you'll have both of them. The last few questions in the exam might not have super comprehensive auto tests. So we might say things like, oh, we'll give you some basic auto tests, but make sure you check for edge cases yourself, kind of like some of the exercises you've seen scattered throughout the course. Um, but certainly, you know, question one, question two, we're not going to be trying to trick you with, with the auto tests that we're giving you there. Um, and then absolutely, you get style checking. Uh, style, while it isn't uh, directly assessed, is certainly something which we'd want you to um, uh, keep an eye on, especially given that that partial marking I was talking about earlier. If you don't tell us about, um, you know, if we can't read your code, we can't give you partial marks for it. Um, Any more questions in the answer. in the chat? There, there are a few more questions. Yes. Um, so there was a question about: Can you give us the last three years of past papers? So we don't release full past papers in the way. Uh, that, that you might see some other courses do. Um, we released the practice exam, we released the um, weekly test revision stuff. There's some revision questions that we'll release and we'll also give you, um, we have like a list that basically says like these old lab exercises, these are kind of like a question three or a question five. Um, but no, we don't release full past papers. Um, uh, I would I would say questions. Oh. I would say weekly tests are a place that old exam questions go to spend their retirement. Yes, indeed. Um, so, like, we're not going to be changing anything up significantly. It's not like we're trying to trick you with the, with the exam. Um, the reason we don't need to give track exams is because generally people find that the questions that we've given throughout the course are of the same caliber as that track exam. Um, can you give us practice theory questions? So there are some question, uh, theory questions in the lab. Uh, there was a later question about, can you release the solutions to those? The solutions will be released on Monday after the lab is due. Same with the, uh, with the uh, weekly test. There are some short answer questions there and the solutions are actually available. You press like a show solutions button. So um, for that one that you don't submit them, you just can look through them and do some revision on them. Um, what else is there? Someone's asking about um, tutor hiring. So I sent, I'm a, in the very near future, I'm sending an email. How it works is I send an email to anyone who's worked as a tutor plus anyone who's taken a comp course in the last two sessions, I think it is. So we will hire you if you're an electrical engineer. We do, we love, we've had some fantastic tutors or electrical engineers, for example. If, if it turns out you're not taking any comp courses um, in a, and you still want to be a tutor, talk to your friends who are doing computing and, and let them, get them to let you know when the application link goes out. But almost everyone who work, wants to work as a tutor is taking a comp course here and there, so they get emailed. So I email about 6,000 people. Uh, but yeah, and anyone who's doing a current comp course gets the email. Cool. Um, and it's worth noting there, just I'll, I'll note because someone asked in the chat, it, what's the required grade to be a tutor? We don't have an official cutoff grade where we're like, if you get a 60, then you're not, never going to be a tutor. But certainly um, what we what we say is we want to make sure that tutors can demonst have demonstrated competency in the course. So that might be that you got 95. Getting a 95 doesn't necessarily mean you're a good tutor, but certainly it would mean you probably have understood the course. But even if you got less than that, if we could see, you know, you did really badly in one of the assignments that you made up for the, the exam, or maybe you had special considerations, like I lost some marks in 1511 because I was sick during assignment two and that meant I didn't get as much as I should have, you know, that's not going to affect anything. It's more just about, did you understand what was in the course? Yeah, so I'm, tutors, I'm looking for good marks and it doesn't have to be 99, but good marks. And, but often people have worked at something requiring those sort of skills 
And the classic one is working, as I say, a maths tutor for high school students. That's, that's the one we see most. But any sort of job that requires communication and you can show you, you know, good at communication, and that could be working in Maccas, for example. So I would encourage you to, you know, well, COVID is having its impacts here, but take on whatever jobs you can get. Um, to, which are, And other employers will do this as well. They look favorably at people who have done all sorts of things and learned all sorts of things from you know, doing random jobs, as well as having academically great marks. It's worth noting as well, though, um, when, when I'm looking at tutors, the things that I'll particularly look at, stuff like um, we get you to submit a video, so like a one minute video that's just sort of you explaining a concept. We definitely look at that and say, you know, does this show that you've got a good way of explaining something and, and how you explain stuff? Um, and then also uh, e even like a history of answering questions on the forum. We, we like we, mm, we can notice that the students who answers lots of good questions on the forum and they certainly have like we have in our heads, oh, that person would be good uh, or also um even if you can't get a job doing practicing things like answering questions on online even forum can be a good way of getting that experience um so that's that's another avenue also like cse sock if cse sock has parts of cse sock that do teaching that do high school outreach that's another place you can get some experience there um there are some two other questions there's another question about where can you see past exams we don't release past exams um, because the sample exam and the um, weekly test, we think, give a good enough picture of what the exam will look like. Um, I think that's all of the questions that we've seen. Okay. Hmm. All right. So let's. You can. There's still an opportunity to ask questions. So let's move back into some content. So let's move through some of these things. Um, Actually, it's not a bad thing to to mention. Yeah, C. All right, it's compiled language normally. You do do our programming languages course comp. Is it three one three one in third year, and you can discover all sorts of complexities and interesting things. But mostly, it's compiled to machine code, and we've used DCC as our compiler at CSC. If you're working away from CSC. Two name, compiler names you'll see are uh, uh, Clang or Clang, depending how you what pronunciation you prefer, and GCC. And in fact, DCC is really built on top of um, Clang. So, if you're if you're doing more stuff after this course, you may well encounter those. It, you can, in theory, put DCC in your home computers, but it's a, it's a little tricky. So a lot of students, if you're working, you want to set up your home computer doing that, you'll probably end up using one of those. What have we learned about C compilers? Yeah, more than a little of this course was learning about what a C compiler does, how it works, and how it might be different to you expect. One thing is, it just it doesn't it reads code from the top to the bottom. It doesn't get, get it all in one go. It reads it through line by line, starting at the top, going to the bottom. And if it hasn't seen something before, it may have effects, even if it, even if that the information is later. And the classic one is you want to call a function, and the function is later, defined later, but you have to give the compiler some information before. So this way the compiler reads code from top to bottom. We've seen that becomes important. All right. We've used the translation to ex executable machine code. We haven't. We don't know anything about how that's done yet, um, from what we've taught. And that's the next course, Comp One Five Two One. For for well, when I say next course, the course Comp One Five Two One. If you're an electrical engineer, that is actually a required course, and it's typically what an electrical engineer takes next. If you're a computing major, I would actually say. Comp 2521 is the most important course to take next, and Comp 1521 can even could even wait a, a, a term. I can't give you global advice because it really there, we've got three main computing programs plus joint degrees, and the the best order differs across all of these a bit. But generally, Comp 2521 is if you're a computing major is the, is the next course. I'm digressing though. Comp 1521, which all computing majors and electrical engineers have to take, we'll talk, show you about machine code. There's just so much we can cover in one course though. C programs, they get started 
by calling the main function. So somewhere, somehow, mysteriously, this main function gets called. It sets everything going, and after that, main can call other functions. Now, every C program has to have one main function and only one main function. You can spread your functions across multiple files, and we've, you've, we've been doing that. And we work with .h files to do that, to synchronize information across these multiple .c files. So we can spread functions across multiple .c files, but we can only ever have one main. There can only ever be one main. OK. So why DCC? Yes, <laughs> nice meme. Um, DCC does all this checking. It's not without its price. You might notice that your programs run a bit slower with DCC, quite a bit slower with DCC. It checks, crucially, I'd say three things it checks. There are three things it really checks that are really important that 1511 students or any beginner program can get told about. DCC checks every array index that it's within the bounds of the array. You compile with GCC or vanilla CLang. If you compile with other compilers, it doesn't happen. Instead, what happens is things catch fire if you index outside arrays. Well, perhaps not literally, though I have heard of that happening literally. Um, so it would actually be poor hardware design if it caught fire with an And my connection dropped out as well. Yes, the stream did stop, but we seem to be back again, and I'm not sure what happened then. Well, we've lost Tom as well, which. Um, but I th yes, we're back. Thank you, Blue pl Blue Plays. Um, all right. Um, so DCC checks array bounds. It checks pointers. It, so it checks pointers are not null. Um, third thing, it checks variables are initialized. So whenever you use something, it makes sure you've assigned a value to it. There are a few other things it can check for, memory leaks, use after free. And so it does a pile of checks. There are ways to get these checks without DCC, but they're complicated and scary. You can, you know, well, well, I encourage you to figure those out, but it, it does a lot of extra checking. Input and output. So hopefully that's easy. That's that's our kangaroo from way back in um, week one. So I don't really understand. Oh no, I do understand. I think I understand that. All right, I think I understand the, what what the meme was trying to get across. But there's our kangaroo from week one. Hopefully we're on top of input and output. Well, let me think about it. Were they complicated? Printf, printf generally, printf is friendly, printf is easy, printf never causes us problems. Um, scanf, yeah, make sure you understand scanf. Scanf does cause people issues. Generally try to keep scanf simple. Don't try to scanf more than one thing at a time. The exam won't depend heavily on its scanf. The crucial questions on the exam are more likely to get you to ask you to write a function. And so you have to work with the inputs to the function. And we'll supply the inputs to the function, and then we'll do a printf of the output of the function. Um, so you won't. The crucial things in the exam won't involve scanf and printf. You've seen that already in lab exercises. So we've had lab exercises where you just write a function and no scanf, no printf. Yeah, scanf and printf are deliberately very simple. And what, I, what I'm trying to say is keep your scanf format strings really, really simple. They probably should just say percent %d, percent %lf, and that, that's about it. Um, printf, you can be clever with your, with your format strings, and, and that's, that's fine. You'll, you'll figure that out. That won't work. Scanf gets people into trouble. Scanf reads from standard input. Printf writes to standard input. So they're symmetric.
All right, hopefully we're back. Hopefully we have the stream. I'm not sure what's causing this. My internet co connection is rock solid. Um, all right. One thing I would mention with scanf is scanf has a return value. And that can be useful if you want to know if the scanf succeeded. And it returns the number of items it manages to read. And I've said, only try and read one thing at a time. So scanf will return one if it manages to read something. And some other value if it doesn't. We probably don't care about the other values, but we probably want to know, we, we might want to know that it managed to read a number. All right. Not needed to pass the exam, but useful to know if you want a good mark on the exam. So there could be questions on the exam in the first part, or in maybe questions four, five, six, and so on, that require you to do output or input of lines and characters. So get char and put char, they're pretty good. They 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 form input and output of single characters. Um, you can replace put char with printf percent c, same difference. But I think it was lab seven was our decrypting lab where you were decrypting code text. So if you want to revise these things, that, that those lab exercises and the two questions there will will give you the feeling there. If you've got if a question or an exercise or a task involves input or output of characters, you have to ask yourself, what's the natural chunk? What's the natural unit here? Does you know, do I want to work with a whole line at a time, or do I want to work with a character at a time? So you remember the lab seven exercises said, you know, map this character to that character decode this character to that. It was character by character coding and decoding. So then you went straight to get char and put char as your natural functions to do the job. But another task might say read lines of input or write lines of output. And f gets and f puts is the writer line of output. But both of these two can also be done with printf. In theory, you can do get char and f gets with scanf, but they, they just get students into problem. So these definitely use those. I don't mind if you use put char and f puts or you use printf, all good. But use these input of a character, input of a line. Now, it's a pretty common thing to want, given a set of characters, to turn them into a number. And the classic function we saw to do this, the, the Struder L. There's a simpler version called A to I. And as far as the exam's concerned, it's not going to matter which one of them you used. But they both take an array of characters and give you back the corresponding integer to those digits. So useful C library functions. You're saying, well, what's the difference between this one? Between them, A to I is really simple. Struder L lets you do some extra thing, has extra features and extra error checking, but it's, it, as a result, it's a bit more complicated. I think we've shown you both in in in, in, in exercises. Oh. Command line arguments. Yeah. Again, not a topic needed to pass the exam. It is a topic if you, you yeah, it can well be a question further in the exam that requires you to know this. Pretty fair bet part one question might involve command line arguments. So what do they look like? Uh, I should show you. Command line arguments are things here. So if I've got a program, have I got any programs here? If I spaceship.c doesn't actually take any command line arguments. I don't know, let me compile spaceship.c, put its output in spaceship. 
I run I run the program like this pro this let's not worry what's in this program. Let's spell spaceship properly. So I run the program, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't it, we can look at what that does shortly. One way of getting our of giving our program inputs is to give it some words on the command line. They could be hello there. And they will be passed to to the program and it can do with them what it likes. In this case, it's just going to ignore them. But we can access those words if we want. We can design our program to look at those words. So that's sort of a second way to get information to our program. The first way we saw was scanf, and then we saw getchar, and we saw fgets. They all read from standard input. They all read characters after the program was running. Command line arguments are something we give when we launch the program with the name of the program. And in fact, there'd be three words for this program. Hmm. Yeah. How do we get at them? They come in as arguments to main. If you don't want to use command line arguments, you don't, ac you don't actually have to put them in main. But if you want to use command line arguments, you have to put these on main. And you get two things, a count of how many command line arguments there are, and an array of strings holding, actually, the command line arguments. Ah, and there's code to access the command line arguments. So count in here, arguments there. Now, if we run this program like I'm showing you here, three words are passed, which is a bit weird. And that's sort of a design choice. Um, but it's not one you'd necessarily expect, is it? So this one, this, this argument here, is sort of always going to be the same. Well, as far as we're concerned, come back and do later courses, and you can see the story can be slightly different. But um, so we, we don't really care about it. So it's really the element, the second and third elements in the array that are interesting to us. So it's quite common to write programs that ignore the ele element at index 0 in the command line arguments, because it's just got the name of the program. And what they want to know is the information the users, the extra information the user is given. So they might look at command line argument 1 or 2. How do they know if there was a command line argument 1 or 2 or 3 or 4? They can look at this. So this is a classic loop that prints out first the program name and then whatever command line arguments there were using percent %s because each command line argument is a string. It's a zero terminated array of char containing ASCII codes. Ah, so that's a nice little loop. So that sort of summarizes working with command line arguments. The one thing you might do if you're going to do some revision, I'd say the best way to do sure. So we've got we we'll give you lots of exercises. There may be tute questions that weren't covered. There may be extra test questions. You can work back through all of these exercises. But the other way to do revision, the other useful thing to do for a revision is get a program like this and play with it. So you might then look at the individual elements of the strings or manipulate this program. Do other things with this program. Pull it apart. Modify it. And there we have a, a meme for this. Yeah. How do you know whether your baby is a programmer from their from their first words? Hmm. All right. Variables. What's a variable? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's hopefully become a familiar concept to you now. Variables store information in memory. They store at any particular point in time 
one particular value. What are the possible values? Well, it depends. It depends on the type of the variable. What does the type of a variable mean? It sets out all the possible variables, values the variable can take. It's a set of possible values for the variable. In most place cases, the set is very large, but is nonetheless a set and a finite set. So int says this variable will hold integers, a subrange of the integers as it turns out. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter that much, but it's a finite subrange of the integers. Double is a bit weird. It's approximations to to real numbers. Char is also integers, a much smaller subrange of the integers. And structs and arrays are compound types. We can change the value of a variable. So a, a ver variable has a value changes through time potentially. A variable's value may change once, twice, a thousand times, a million times. Through the execution time of a program, a variable may take many, many different values. We've learned, I guess, you've seen in earlier maths linear equations where you, you, know, you say x equals 2a plus 3b, y equals 5, 5a plus you know, 7b, things like this. These things, x and y here, are not variables. They have just one value. So coding is a very different thing, isn't it? Because x can be 7 here, then as the program executes on, x could be 9, and as it executes further down, x could be set to 3, or a loop could change x every time around the loop. <sighs> we can pass Andrew, the value a... question. Yeah, there, there is a good question. I'm not sure whether this is the right time to, to go into it, but there's a question over the difference between char star and char square brackets. So maybe when we get past functions, that might be a good bit That to go might into. be a good question. Yeah, no, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, We'll get to that. Yeah, actually, the, ask that question again, whoever asked it, when we get to pointers. All right. Yeah, there's an interesting thing with variables when we pass them to functions. I guess this is more about functions. If we if we just it looks like we're passing a variable to a function. If we're calling function f and we say f x, that looks like we're passing the the variable to the function. We're not. We're not we're actually passing the value of the variable. So if x contains 27, that's the same as doing that. Why does that matter? It only matters if the function wants to change x. So you can't, a function can't change a variable. But, there's a crucial but, and this is why we had to bring in pointers. You can use pointers. You can pass a pointer to a function, and what gets passed is really the value of the pointer, but that doesn't matter because you can use the pointer's value to access whatever it points to. So if we pass a pointer to a variable to a function, it can use that value to access the variable the function points to. And that lets us modify variables in a function. And we, we saw this without knowing way back in time here. So let me, it's worth recapping that because it, it was really annoying way back in week two saying scanf, put an ampersand, printf, don't put an ampersand. But we can see why now. Printf only needs the value of number. Printf doesn't change variables. All printf does is, is put some bytes on it on output. It doesn't change any variables. So it, it's fine for it, you to just say variable there. It doesn't need to change number. But scanf, scanf's whole job is to get some bytes, turn them into a value, and put it in a variable. That's what scanf does. So it's got to get a pointer to number. So there scanf is being given a pointer to number, 
and that allows scanf to do its job it gets what it reads in the integer and puts it in whatever that pointer points to which will be number so that explains why we've got to put an ampersand there to get a pointer to number to give to scanf that's how, that's how scanf has to be designed and hopefully that makes sense now way back in week two we just had to so that's how how you write scanf hash define hash define is a different things yeah mm -hmm. hash define gives us a very different possibility it's helpful to be able to give names to constant values right through our program we could sort of do that with variables and programmers sometimes do that you could you could have a variable just put the value in it and use the variable that's sort of okay but we can't do it across our program and then when you're reading the code you, you don't understand you're not sure whether that variable ever changes or there only ever has one value so we really want need a way to, to be able to define constants things that never change and it's obvious when you're reading the program that they never change this is something that's immutable never it stays the same for the whole program execution you think well why what's the point of something that's just the same let's go, let's I've got an example here I think is next so here is hash defining Goku has 9001 you're saying well what's the point Andrew what's the point I could just write 9001 everywhere in my program and that's exactly the same the first point is yes yes it's exactly the same so how do hash defines work the compiler actually goes through every time it sees a hash define it then goes through the entire program and says every, anywhere I can see Goku just put 9001 there it does that before doing anything else, which can, can get us into trouble. Um, it's why hash defines, uh, you've got to be careful if you try to do complicated things with them. They can produce weird, weird bugs. Um, we've been using hash defines for really simple things for, for just for numbers, and that's, that's fairly safe. But it just goes through the entire program and puts the 9001. So you're saying, well, why couldn't we do that? It gives us a few things one is it puts a name there rather than a number and that can make our program much more readable because the name can explain what the concept is it gives us maintainability changeability if we need to up change this value we can do it in one place it might be used in 50 different pro places in or a thousand different places in a large program we can change it just in one place if we have to update our program yeah sometimes clever people think ah oh, but 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 I know how to do that I can just do a search and replace and change 9001 to you know 9003 with just my search and replace tool and that sure that sort of works sort of works except there are two there are two big issues with that really one is um, what if 9001 gets used for two different purposes through your program not so likely with 9001 but what if it's a common value like 10 or a thousand that could be used for a few purposes and you only want to change one purpose so one concept is one thing is changing the other is often it gets offset so you know with loops you sometimes have to subtract one add one and so on so the the value that appears in the text might then be 9000 because it's got to be this value minus 1. So if it's written as Goku minus 1 and we decide to change Goku to 9003 that will work. If it's written as 9000 this search and replace won't work. So if we can isolate this value in one spot we can update our program easily. And we, we've seen this. We've had examples that are you know working with a deck of cards or something like that. If we want to change the deck size we can just change it in one place and then the whole program all the loops all the arrays all the functions then work we're working with you know, we decide to go with 20 sided dice we change it in one place and then everything should just work you think 
I find it hard to write code like that. Yeah, it's one of the skills is to write code that just depends on one thing there and everything shakes out. You change that and everything just works. Crucial thing here is it's all in capitals. Why? Why? Because to make readability better. So if I see something in lowercase like that, I know it's a variable. It has the properties of a variable. It can update. If I see something in uppercase, following the convention, I know it's a constant. It's just not changing. It's the same all the way through the program. The, once the program's compiled, it doesn't change. So this distinction between something that varies through with execution, something with that doesn't, it's, it's crucial when we're reading programs, trying to understand them. So we, we, we make it obvious in, in the texts of our programs. Um, all right. So I'm betting, I'm betting, I like this meme, it took me, I must admit, it took me a little while to figure it out, um, that this student meme is superb. Uh, so this is the difference between, can, well, it shows a couple of things, the difference, some of the differences between the things we had to learn to understand if statements, but also the, the subtle ambiguities that, that mean that the reason we use C to program computers and not English because we need to get to very precise meaning. So it, for those of you who are like me, not very quick at understanding, this has sort of been understood to be an if statement. So the condition is they have avocados. I'm not sure that's how you spell avocados. It doesn't look right to me. But anyway, I guess I misspell a lot of things as well. Um, so if they have avocados, get six. And let's get six milk. So he's got to get six milk. If you actually did natural language processing, they, they talk at length about this sort of sentence and how you understand it and how you. It's interesting. Um, it's quite. Com it's really complicated understanding that. Whereas a C program is unambiguous. So that's sort of an interesting example. But if statements, condition, body, condition, if it's true, do something. Is there anything that's causing us problems with if statements? Well, some of the conditions with linked lists and pointers and the, the conditions, figuring out the right condition can be tricky. But how an if statement works itself, I'm hoping that's OK. Yeah, so if it's x, x less than y, yeah, we're, we're hopefully all on top of this. I, I, I say, I'm, I, you spend a lot of time as a lecturer saying, don't panic, don't panic. This stuff takes a while to understand. But yes, if you haven't understood what that sort of thing does now, you, you prob this is at the, 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 the yeah, panic stage. Um, loops. Right. Looping through stuff with while. Executing a body until the condition is false. So a see while statement could execute zero times if the condition is false initially. Could execute 50 times. And could execute a million times. So how does a condition change? If it's It has to be true for the loop to execute at all. And usually something inside the loop potentially changes the condition. If nothing does, the loop executes forever. I guess there's more a side note. Yeah, we've seen lots of little weird things that there are things that are less important. I plus plus versus I equals I plus one. What is the difference? And for comp one five one one, what we do in comp one five one, there's zero difference. If you if you want to if you want to puzzle your tutor, you can ask them. There is a difference. There's a very subtle difference that doesn't affect any sort of coding we do. You can ask your tutor if they know what the difference is. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a good point, actually. We don't tell you absolutely everything about C. There are a hell of a lot of people out there writing C code who don't know everything about C. Some of them know too little about C. Uh, a lot of them just need know what they need to know about C. So, And we've tried to keep focused on the bits of C that we need to know for, to understand the crucial concepts we're getting through and, and you know to, that will serve you well in future courses whether they involve C or not 
So what am I talking about? Yeah, it's the classic loop thing. So here's our loop condition. So we, we can we can ask ourselves first, will that loop execute at all? Is that condition, you've got to get start thinking logically. Well, you've been thinking logically, hopefully for weeks now, but hopefully you've learnt logically to, to do things. One of the things you do is sort of work backwards, isn't it? So I say, is this condition going to be true first time? So then you've got to execute backwards and figure out what value I will have. In this case, it's pretty obvious. I has just been assigned zero the line before, so it must be zero the first time. So the loop must execute. If this was 50, it's a perfectly valid C program. It's a stupid C program, but it's valid. And it, it would never execute what's in here, which makes it a bit of a waste of time. DCC might even give you a warning message saying, well, look, that program looks a bit weird to me. It's it's You're allowed to do that, but why would you want to do that? So. Now, the loop executes until the condition is false. So typically, loop conditions involve a variable, something whose value can change. If that, if this was something that was hash defined, that would, that, again, that would be stupid. That, would, that loop would either execute zero times or a million times. But it's something that can change. And typically, in the loop, there will be a change to the variable, like that i++, which is i equals i plus 1, as Pam was telling us. So, now, here's my here's the big tip for those first exam questions. Looking at them, when you do an array index, ask yourself how you know that array element, array index, sorry, value is it within the bounds, within the legal array indexes. This is an array of size 10, so the possible array elements are 0 to 9. How do we know? that's within those values. So it starts off at 0, it goes upwards, so we're good there. And we also know i is less than 10. And those two pieces of logic between us can tell us this is always a valid index for the array. And if you think about it further, you can see this executes once for each array element. I'm hoping I'm hoping that you're all confident with this. So this is, you'll have to do a bit more than this, understand more than this to do the first question on the exam. But it, you will have to be, you'll be right loops, right, you know, right loops, loop, or loops that give an array, work out something or do something, and, and, and sort of calculate indexes, get values, store values, and do something. Uh, all right, I think this is a, actually, before we switch to this one, it might be a good time to um, take a, a, a short break. So I'm going to ask Tom, we're still coming back to a question about char star. Is there anything else we should mention, Tom, before we take a short break? I don't think so. I think that gets through everything that's in the chat, apart from there's a question about assignment one extension marks, which are coming very shortly. Yeah, sorry. Things like the extension marks, uh, students are, are less stressed about, so we put a little bit less priority. I know you. I know you put a lot of work into the extension, and, that's, and it's fantastic. You're doing fantastic to be working on the extension, but it's not. It's not. You know, pass fail, life death, whatever. Nothing is life death, but anyway, it's less important. But we will have it out to you very soon. All right. So let's. I need to take a short break from talking. Uh, hopefully we've sorted out our technical difficulties. Um, I don't know, my stream stopped twice, and, but Thomas seemed to be having problems as well, but my internet was um, rock solid. All right, before I go, are we allowed to use break in the assignment for loops? Yeah, the style guide, the, the, I went to some effort to get the style guide wording there correct, I think. Generally, avoid using break unless you are sure it makes your program clearer. Um, students often overuse break and produce co code that's harder to read. So if a use of break made your code clearer, you were sure it made your code simpler and clearer, that would be okay. For the most part, you don't need it. 
continuous breaks friend that is, is students nightmare students almost always using continue make their code worse so we we, we, di we really discourage people from using continue from long experience of seeing students put continue in their code and make it more complicated and harder to read and more buggy than, than if it would if they hadn't used continue um, so if you're sure it, it break is needed makes your code better there won't be a style penalty um, in the exam we don't give you marks for style so we're not going to penalize you using for break but be, again beware students do confuse themselves with break and even more so with continue all right let's take a let's take a five minute break and we'll come back to talk some more about this stuff
All right, hi everyone. We are back. Um, hopefully, issue free. I was just complaining to Tom that we had networking problems, but it's not. I've got a rock solid connection to some places in the network, but apparently not to others. Or yeah, in fact, to one part of Google, but not to other parts of Google. Or something weird. Some of you can you can go on and do the networking courses and come back and tell me what, what these what these network architecture issues are and what causes them. All right, so this is good. Again, if you don't understand that, uh, I'd be worried at this stage. Uh, this should be comfortable. This should, we really really should be able to think like a coder here. The next one, the the next one, yeah. This is this is where things get a lot more scary. It's the same idea though. This gave us a loop that executed once for everything in an array, and the th every the thing we did, the the Andrew? task we'd put. Oh, my um, image is not sharing properly. My screen is not sharing. Yes, I just realised that. All right, all right. Um, let me start again. So this. This this should be familiar. The payload in the loop varies a lot, and it's possible we'd even put another loop there. Uh, particularly, if we have a two-dimensional array like assignment one. But that's do something where, and this is the something for each array element. In this case, it's, it's put the i in there, so each array element contains its index. This is in turn moved through a linked list. Now this loop is, is this is pointless code because there's no job here. Without a job here, what what's the point of this code? So we you'd normally have it some sort of job here that did something with the current pointer as it moves through the linked list. But this is this is this is the stuff to get your head around to pass the course. So if you're worried about passing a file. Moving through a linked list is crucial. Understanding this code, which sets a pointer to the first thing in the linked list, and executes this loop once, for, with the pointer pointing at each thing in the linked list. So first time through the loop, it points at the first thing. Second time, the second thing in the list, and so on, until it finishes up with a null pointer and the loop terminates. So this programming pattern, it's missing a heart here. It's missing, you know, what what it does. It there could be a printf, just print out some the fields in each of each thing in the linked list. But this pattern, it's crucial. This is, question one will involve this sort of pattern. You know, maybe it involved two loops like this. Maybe, maybe, maybe something more like that. But <laughs> so I'm not sure how that meme fits in the flow of the lecture. Society for Ray started. I don't think that's really true. But that's a that's an interesting point, isn't it? That was one crucial lesson we've had. What's the element index of the first element in the array? There's a choice there, and 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 at first people said, "Oh, we'll make the first index of the first element be one," but then coders realised it actually lots of things work better if the first index is zero. If you if you want really scary, there are languages out there that let you say what you want the first index value to be, and that helps no one. It really doesn't. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So, what's an array? Crucially, it's a collection of variables, and they, each variable has to be the same type. We use them when we need lots of the same type of variable. The size is fixed when it's created. So when we create the array, it might have 37 elements. That array is going to have 37 elements for its life. C arrays do not grow, they do not shrink. They just stay the same. Each array element has to be the same. You can't have an array where element 0 is an int, element 1 is a double, element 2 is a char, you can't mix arrays. Have the, the the word I like is homogenous, which is it's a complicated English word meaning all the same. So if an array's got four elements, they can all be ints, they can all be doubles, they can all be any type of variable, 
but they all have to be the same. They don't have names. Array elements do not have names. They have numbers, which is their index. So a four element array, you want to know, we want to talk about any one of the elements, any one of the four variables in the array, you specify the number. You specify, I want element two, I want element index zero, I want element index three. They all live side by side in memory. Doesn't matter much to us in this course. It gets a bit, it gets important later on in in later courses. But they all they're all side by side in memory. So we need to know about arrays. Well, a collection of variables of the same type, and you can have an array of anything. So you can have an array of an arrays, and that seems scary at first. But then assignment one, and you got you got comfortable with that. So you could have int x, which was five array, an array of five arrays of seven ints. And that all sort of worked. Can you have arrays of pointers? Yes, you actually can have arrays of pointers, but I don't think we ever need to do that in this course. Something maybe after the exams you can you can try doing yourself. Can you have arrays of structs? Yes, you can. Again, not something we do in this course. You can try playing with that after the exam, after all your exams. Please don't fail maths because you decided to play with C. I mean, that's not sort of a abstract hypothetical questions. There's more than one tutor I know who maths marks would be better if they hadn't started exploring you know, weird programming problems when they should have been studying for maths. I don't Let know what you're talking about, Andrew. Um, so I'd say that let that be a lesson to you after the exams are over play with all sorts of weird and wonderful computing things if you're enjoying coding um, not before exams and set aside so a lot of you have math what's it one one three one I can't remember which math there's a math exam Friday a lot of you have math exams early in the exam period do set aside plenty of time there use smart strategy there it's likely I, I, I don't I don't know what you like at maths I don't know what the courses are like exactly but I'm guessing I'm guessing and for many of you more study on C probably won't help you that much with 11511 whereas more study with maths is going to help you a huge amount so you should you should set aside a couple of days to just maths 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 pass your maths and then you still have a day or two left to work on your you revise your 1511 C coding you can make your own decision. There, we, we do get students who are like, oh, Andrew, I can get 95 for maths in my sleep, but I really struggle with loops. So if you're that student, yeah. You, but prioritize, smart prioritization there, please. So there was fun. All, I'm hoping all of this is, e ooh. I was hoping all of this is easy, but this code is broken. Um, why is this broken? You can only initialize array when you declare, oh, yeah, I can see why it's broken. That should be in marks 10 equals. I hate putting code in lecture notes without actually compiling it. Almost always when I put code in lecture notes, I try to make sure it, it's compiled. Um, so it, I know it's correct. A compiler has run over it. If you want, Anyway, you can initialize an array with curly braces was the point there. So you can put values there. Any one, if you use curly braces and you leave anything out, those values get zero. So we can just put a single zero there to initialize the first array element to zero, and C will then initialize all the rest. You're saying why? <laughs> Not a good, there's no good answer to that, but that's how it is. So if you've got a 10 element array and you want to initialize it, you can just put curly braces, zero and a brace, and that will initialize all array elements to, to zero. You could also put 10 different non zero values if you felt like it. We can assign to array element. We can, we can, we, and this is why arrays are exciting, is because we can commute, compute the index of the array. If you couldn't compute the index of an array, array arrays would be, you know, pretty useless. There'd be no more, no, no more powerful than any the other sort of variables. But because you can compute the index, you can do computation to work out which element you're going to read, or sorry, you know, get the value of, or put the value to, um, then. Arrays are powerful and interesting. But always, always, whenever you 
So it's it's not just a matter of safety. It's not a ma ma matter of avoiding errors. But it, it you, every time you use an array index, you should be asking how you know it's within the bounds, just as part of the logic of your program. Often students will have a, a fundamental bug in their program, and they would have realized they had a bug in a program just by thinking about, is this index guaranteed to be in bounds? So it's not just that it produces an error, but your whole program structure is broken. And you'd realize that if you thought, how do I know what's going in there is valid for the array? And of course, we know that because it's a 10 element array, it's 0 to 9. So we know that 10 is broken. 10 doesn't work. Ah. I am guilty of, of, of writing programs with incredibly large mains, which then become unreadable. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we have functions, so we can we can use the one piece of code in many places. So we can put a code piece of code in one place and execute it from many places. And by execute, I mean call it. And we want to pass particular values to it every time we call it. We call those input parameters. And we may want to get a value back, and that would be the output returned by the function. We give the block of code a name. And this has so many advantages. It lets us reuse code, so it stops us writing the same line of code ten place ten t same piece of code you know ten twenty thirty times throughout our program. It lets us manage complexity. That's the huge thing. It then isolates this code in a manageable chunk that we can sit on the screen of our laptop and consider it. We can look at it. Is this correct? We can test it in isolation. We've got a little main function that calls just this function and tests it. It's the the whole thing of giving a name and replacing this body of code with the name a call to that name just makes the the function using this code so much more functions are the key to to being able to build larger pieces of software everything would just be impossible not 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 theoretically impossible practically impossible without functions so do you need to understand functions to pass the exam? Well, to some extent, because the first questions that you, ha you have to get one of question one and one of question two, you know, sort of working 50%. And they will involve functions. So you've got to understand them to that extent. You, can, you could get through the exam, I guess, without being able to write a new function. But it's certainly that there'll be exam questions that you may require you writing new functions. And that's a bit harder. So we've seen this up here. We have to say beforehand, and this is a consequence of C heading through the code from start to finish. So when it gets to a call to a function, we're saying send execution off to function add with these, with parameter one as first and parameter two as second, and put the result back into total. C is, has to know about the function add before it gets this call. Before you use it, it has to be told about that function, about types. And how do we do that? We put a promise up here, a function declaration that says, later on, still to come somewhere, is a function add. It takes two parameters. Each one is an int, and it gives back an int. That's all I'm telling you for now. Later on, you'll get the rest of the story. And C so says, all right, OK, you can call function add then. I've seen, I've been told about it. I haven't actually seen what it is, but you can call it here. And then later on down here, it has to be told this. Now, there's a little bit more to the story, isn't it? That function, if you do a multi-file project, that function can actually be off in a separate file. But then, then we go to .h files. We'll put this in a .h file. But even in a single file, we've got to do this promise. All right. But hopefully you've got used to that. We've seen program after program that looks like this. There are these three functions to come. Here's main, and it'll call one or two of the functions, and maybe one of them functions will call the other functions, and down here will the functions. So declarations telling the C compiler still to come is a function that's going to look like this. I'd call this, by the way, the prototype. That's a common word for it, function prototype. The other one you'll see if you're looking at read, trying to read books or things like that is function signature. It all means the same things. It's, it's what shape does a function take? How many inputs? 
what type is input 1, what type is input 2, if it has 3 inputs, what type is input 3, what's its name of course, and what's its return type. <sighs> bigger topic, much bigger topic, well not bigger topic, harder topic, but yeah, now things get more complicated. Pointers. What's a point pointer? I'd actually say it's a you know, a reference to something. That, that's how I like to think about it. Student, a lot of students like to think about it instead. It's 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 an address. It can it's a it's a variable that can hold an address. So, what can we do with a pointer? We can make it point at something. So we can say to a pointer, "I want you to point." at this variable. So if p is a pointer, what does that look like? That says, if you want p to point at variable x, you say that. But p can, a pointer can point at different variables through the course of its lifetime. So you can say p point at this variable, and you can do that many times in your program and have point, p pointing at different variables at different times. If p is pointing at a variable, if you have a pointer pointing at a variable, you can do anything that you can do with a variable via the asterisk operator. The asterisk operator says, I want to talk about the variable that this pointer points to. Access the variable this pointer points to, I can get its value, and I can assign to it. If I've got a pointer to a variable, I can change it. So if p points at a variable, asterisk p equals 32 says, change whatever variable p points to to 32. Uh, you think, but, well, but, but wait, what if p points to something that you know, can't be assigned an in? Yeah, so pointer, it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that, isn't it? When we say we have a, we declare a pointer, we have to say what type of variable it points to, so then we know what type of thing this is. You could actually just use ampersand and asterisk to reference and address of, if, if you want to call them that, to do everything. They're, they're enough to do everything, but arrows a friend, arrows a convenient friend, a convenient um, shorthand, that's the word I'm trying to reach for. It's a shorthand. It's if it's very common, particularly when working with linked lists, to say, here's a pointer which points at a struct. I want to talk about a field of the struct. So arrow combines following a pointer and accessing a field in a struct into one convenient operation. So you could do that without you could do that with ampersand and dot, but Turns out, for almost everything we do with linked lists, we use arrows. So that's that's quite nice. Uh, all right. So this is a, the sim we saw this before, but this is a classic simple piece of code that's changing a variable by using a pointer. Remember, if I just passed i through to this, I just passed i through to this function. Um, I couldn't change, the function can't change a variable. But what I do is get a pointer to i and pass it to the f through to the function. Actually, we better call that something different. We'll call that j. There we go. If I get a pointer to i, so I get ip points at i and pass the pointer through. It's actually the value of the pointer that gets passed through, but it doesn't matter because what are we saying here? Take this pointer, go to whatever address it points to, and change that variable. Add one to it and put it back in the variable. So using this, this lets us change a variable inside a function. Do you need to do that? Well, in some places, yeah, in some places. So we saw scanf. Yeah, you actually, if you're careful, you need to do it less than you'd think. You can do an awful lot of coding without ever changing a variable inside a function. But there are some things it's more convenient. Uh, why would it be more convenient? Uh, I know. 
because a function can return just one thing. This, this function is returning none. So if we need a function to return three values, four values, we can pass pointers to four variables and have it change those four variables to pass back the four things we wanted to come back. So that's one programming need we can solve with, with pointers. And it's not the only one, but it's one of them. Yeah, this is more, this, yeah, all right. This meme is meant to make you feel not alone. Uh, this is really all programmers. Um, so it's rare, for example, I'd be faced with a C program or a small C program with wondering like this. But it's not uncommon for me dealing with other things. I'm not the world's best JavaScript programmer. So often facing JavaScript, for example, I'd be looking at this code saying it works now, but I really don't know why that change made it work, which is a very leaves you very feeling very uncomfortable. Um, so all of us face this more often than we'd like to admit when dealing with code, which can be a bit worrying when that code is sort of underlying important parts of the world. And I would say, by the way, yeah, as during your revision, yeah, it can be making changes, adding printfs, th thinking about things, uh, trying to understand more about why code you wrote worked or didn't work. And that's not a bad sort of source of revision during the exam. Right. Problem solving, yeah. We've tried to give you clues to this. This is something that's a lesson that you learn right through years and years. So you'll 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 develop over the next three four years as you go through UNSW, but beyond that as well. Uh, Decomposition. I've said functions are amazing because they let you just code up this bit. I can test this bit in isolation, write up a special little main function to call it, get this function working, and then I've got that. Then maybe I can code up another function. I can even test it in isolation by calling it from a special main and put that into my program. So I can then code up maybe four functions and put them all, to test them all in isolation, and then join them all together and have a working program. So breaking things down into parts, but the natural part of a C program is a function. So, yeah, solve the ones you can do easily, get them working, and and test them and move on. Yeah. This this is this is not just code at C. This is not just coding. This, if you're building a, a, a you know an electrical system or you know hardware, you 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 work on this work in this way as well. Often you design if you're designing a circuit board, you put in especially put in little even extra chips so you've got ex, you can find out extra information about what's happening inside the board so you can test parts of the board and find out what's happening and before you know moving on to other parts of the board. I'm not sure how I feel about this meme. Uh, it's about indenting. So, and it's certainly true. If it, it, it's one thing that uh, programmers, that, but there's more argument about indenting than anything else in programming that, that has so little, <laughs> that's so pointless. Um, consistency would be, I guess, yeah, there's a good point here about cons what, what's important is really consistency. Uh, uh, Otherwise, we'd say, yeah, just copy us. And you can after the after after you've been programming for a while, you can you can join in arguments about indenting. <sighs> style. So why do we have style? Because humans have to read our code. It may be it may be you're writing code that there's just one human reading. If there's but. You've still got to read it while you develop the code. My, my key point with the exam would be I see over and over again students just completely abandon any sort of reasonable style, stop indenting, call their variables A, B, C, D, E, in that they're rushed to finish this exam question in 10 minutes or whatever, and then they can't debug their code because they can't read the code themselves. So they confuse themselves. So in the exam where there's really one person reading your code, um, to use decent style. Well, that's not true. Then yeah. the marker will have to read your code, and then you need decent style for the marker. 
But in the real world, so many people might be reading your code. You'll, you'll probably be on working with teams. Even at UNSW, you'll be working in teams of several students, or maybe you'll be staff members. And other people have to read your code. It, it's, it's worth saying, I've, I've never once <laughs> in my time programming encountered a situation where I was annoyed that I'd written something with good style but I don't think I've got enough fingers, toes, and atoms in my body to count the number of times I've wished that I'd written something with better style. So, you know, it's, it's good to if you just get into the default habit of, I'm gonna write this with good style. Trust me, that's a, um, a good thing to be doing. Uh, and All on right. the note of um, problem solving, it's worth noting if you're really interested in more about problem solving, uh, there was a lecture during week six that Sasha Vassar gave, which might be a good thing to go back and take a look at. Oh, yeah, I didn't. Sorry, I got busy in week six and didn't get to to check in on that. But that would be great. I'm sure that's, Sasha's really nice, so really good. So that would be interesting. All right. Yeah. So we, we, if we use good style, we use common ways of writing things. It's much easier for other people to read our code and we can learn and we can help and um, we can teach people. So. Sometimes as a lecturer, it's hard, but you, you can say to a student, Oh God, no! I'm not going to help. I can't help you with that code. I just can't. I can't physically read it. Go away and you know, format it like we've shown you, and try and think about and give it better variable names, and then come back and I'll, I'll I'll try and tell you what your bug is. And and half the time the student never comes back because by the time they've formatted their code and given things good variable names, they've actually it's enabled them to see what the problem is. Uh. So I don't think I really understand this meme. I do understand the importance of debugging. Um, and yet we, we, we use pretty simple, we, we use very simple debugging tools. And I would say that you, people use quite sophisticated debugging setups and structures and tools in various contexts in coding. But I would say that you also you debug in exactly the same way you were taught in 1511 in a lot of key contexts in in um, coding. The Linux creator, for example, is famous for still debugging in pretty much the same way that we do in lectures. And All it's right. worth noting, um, given the time we've got left, it might be good to try and speed through the essential parts and possibly answer <laughs> that question about chart stars. All right. Oh, we are running out of time. Um, all right. I may have to come back and do some of this. Um, All right. Uh, let's 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 talk about structs. So there's an example of code with um, structs. What is this? Like an array, structs are very much analogous to arrays. Several key differences. Key differences are the things in the struct, the variables in the struct can have different types, and they do in this struct. And they have names. They don't have indexes, they have names. So it makes structs less useful in one way because you can't compute which element of a struct you're looking up. Well, not easily anyway. Um, like you can't do the simple computation you do with arrays. Um, but the different types is useful. So this, one way to describe it is it's a template for a variable, a template for setting out this variable contains three, three variables, name, engines, and wings. So I declare a struct spaceship variable, x wing, and I get these three variables put together. And I can assign to the subparts using dot, so I can say it's got four engines, four wings. And because this is a char array, I could assign to the individual, individual elements, but strict copy here, the string copying routine is my friend here. I can also take a pointer to it. If I've got a pointer to a struct, rather than use asterisk and dot to dereference the pointer and then talk about a field, 
it's nicer just to use an arrow. Left hand side of the arrow must be a pointer to a struct. Right hand side must be a name of the field of that type of struct. Well, that's okay, but we went a step further. We used malloc and free in conjunction with stacks. malloc allows us to allocate a free memory under our control. So what happens with a variable in a function? Variables in functions, when the function starts, they're created. When, they exit, when the function returns, they're destroyed. So the lifetime of the variable is not under our control, except, well, only by calling the function, returning from the function. And the variable can't live after the function. So we can't control the variable lifetime. We can create these variables that live to it forever, well, as long as, as, long as we want with malloc. Malloc will say, here's a piece of memory, which you can put variables in, and you can have the variables in that memory for as long as you like, call free when you're done. And good programming practice is to call free when we're done. And if we don't, it's called a memory leak. And we, we set this, you know, it's something that causes problems for coding, so we require you to call free because that's necessary in a lot of contexts. To go with malloc, we need something to tell us how big variables are. And that's size of. Size of will tell us exactly how many bytes we need for a variable. So whenever we use malloc, we use the size of operator to, to tell malloc how many bytes we want. So we'll get the right number of bytes for our variable. Here's the next step in this. So rather than declare a variable inside our function that can contain these, we can say to malloc, oh no, you just give me the bytes that will hold one struct spaceship. That might be, I don't know, 100 bytes, whatever it is. So size of, we don't need to know. Size of works that out until, and, and that value gets passed to malloc. We get back a pointer to a piece of memory that can hold those three things. It doesn't have a name. Yeah. So we've got this anonymous bit of memory that can hold those three things. We've got a pointer to it. And it's crucial when we're finished with that pointer, we say, oh, I'm done. So we say free to say, I'm done with that memory. And if we now try to use that pointer afterwards, that, that would be, a, that's a major error. What some people do, by the way, to avoid that is they then they overwrite the pointer. So they might say that they'll stop it happening. They'll say, well, that's, that sort of stops it happening. It's not something, we, it's, it's not foolproof. So we don't do it in this course. Here's the same as the last code, putting stuff in there. Now, this, this main function's a bit silly because it's, it's just doing within the main function. But now everything's under our control. We can call malloc, we can call free, we can call malloc as many times as we like. So we can create a thousand spaceships, destroy a thousand spaceships. It's up to us. Yeah. And here's the last part of the problem. The last, the last uh, putting this together gives us one more possibility if we have a pointer inside our struct. So a struct can have, you can have a struct that just has two ints. A common struct actually has three doubles to hold a point in 3D space. But instead what we've done is this. Inside our struct, we have a field that can point to one of these structs. And we use these to chain together the structs. So we keep somewhere in a separate pointer, a variable often get called head, pointer to the first struct. And there's a field in the struct that points to the next one, the next one, the next one. And the last one here, the last element, if you look at the pointer in there, it'll contain the special value null to say it doesn't point at anything. Hence the loop we saw early. Arrays can't change in size. These chains of struct links to lists linked together can, can grow and shrink as we need it, completely under our control. It's also hard to put something in the middle of an array, move everything out of the way. Easy to do with these linked lists. And there are, there are, 
they're our first taste of a whole suite of data structures that let us do complicated things. So that's a really simple piece of code using two calls to this add node function to chain together three of these structs. When this exits, we'll have head pointing at one struct. Its next field will, well, sorry, head will point, there'll be two structs finished. And writing these out and sketching it out is the best thing to do. So head will point to the first struct, which will contain Tatooine. The next one will contain Yavin 4. This point will go there, and that will say null. So sketching out these structs, particularly with doing things like deleting from linked lists or uh, inserting into linked lists, is, is the way to figure things out. Yes, we can, we can even chain together arrows. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? There are many possibilities, um, and this is how I'd encourage you to do revision for linked list, is work with s small programs and work through the possibilities. See if you your sketch out what you think is happening on a piece of paper or somewhere, and then run the program and see what happens. And if you can't understand what's happening when you're revising for the exam with programs like this, by all means post in the course forum and other students or the lecturer will explain what's happening. Um, so I've got code here that sets up a linked list. So it creates head and it's the structure we've, we've created a linked list of two things here. So head points to the first thing. Alderan is the first one. Sorry, you can't read my writing. Um, Dantooine is the second. So that's the, that's what we've got here. All right. Then we create another pointer called. Alderan, which points to the same struct. You can have more than one pointing pointer pointing to the same place. You can have ten pointers pointing at the same variable. So we've got Alderan, the variable Alderan here, pointing at this field. We've got head pointing at this field. Oh, I shouldn't have accidentally erased that. What happens? here if we say head points at malloc size structured location. That creates a new chunk of memory and head points to it. We still have Alderan pointing at the original two structs. So we still have a way of getting to the original two structs. If we didn't have this line, we'd have no way of getting to the original two structs. So what we often have to do with that with pointers is create extra variables so we still have connections to structs. When we're working around with, with, with the linked lists, we often have to cre create extra pointers to, so we keep track of, of, of the structs. So that was our original situation after the two were created. So oh, it's better doing this this way, isn't it? This diagram is much, much, much clearer. Then we, we did this, and that said, make Aldrin point the same place head does. So we've got two pointers pointing at this one struct. The next call to malloc created this separate struct. As I said, we'd be in trouble if Alderan, if we didn't have the variable Alderan pointing here, we'd have nothing pointing at this. It's like, what's the problem? Well, we, if we want to free those, for example, we need a pointer to them. If, if we lose all pointers to a piece of malloc memory, then it's, we, put no, we can't do anything with it. It's just floating there, inaccessible. So that's the final state. So writing little programs like this 
trying to sketch out what you think happens, trying to confirm that's what you think happens, um, is, is the way to understand structs and the way to study for, for the exam, I'd say. So if I assign to a pointer, if, if, I, if I say p equals you know something, I change what it points at, what its target is, where it goes. I don't change the variable it's pointer at. But if I say p arrow something, you know, p arrow next, I'm then using the pointer to go to a variable and changing that. That's not changing p, that's changing something p points at. It's a crucial difference and you've got to get your head around all of this. This is the hardest thing, uh, the hardest concepts in the course. So working through simple examples like that. And we'll in, we'll in revision classes or revision sessions, I think is the term, we'll, we will do that next week. That'll be certainly one of the revision sessions next week. Abstract data types. Yeah, there could well be exam questions on abstract data types. Yes, in fact, almost certainly will be. 90% uh, I'd say, but it's also it's not many marks for understanding abstract data types, not something you need to be studying if you're worried about passing or failing the exam, not an important topic. What a HD? Yeah, this is something this is something you should understand well. Um, they let us hide away some of the details. So what we might tell a user is just this. How would we tell them? We'd say, here's a .h file. This tells you everything you need to know about these useful functions. What do they do? They let you create a ship, free a ship, or send a ship on a voyage. We're not actually going to tell you what's in how a ship gets represented. Why is that? Because then this limit that segregates off how a ship works from how it's being used and lets us work separately on those two things. It, it manages the complexity. We can we can update the code, change the code, um, put different code behind there. And we saw putting arrays and linked lists. Sorry, we saw putting arrays and linked lists behind a stack data structure as our key example with this. This is what the .h file looks is. That's the external view of a ship. This is our internal view. This is how we implement the ship. This is what we, we, we say, this is, oh, we're representing a ship like this. When, when the user asks us to create a ship, we do this. When we say free a ship, do this. When the send the voyage, we do, we do that. That's the code's a bit silly, but that's okay. This is our implementation. This is actually using, this is what it looks from the user side, the, the other side of the, of the .h file. They, they include the .h file, they say create this ship, and send it on a voyage. All right, I won't talk about recursion because it's, that's not a key topic and we're, we're out of time, but you can work on that. All right, so let's, let's wrap up the last standard lecture of Comp 1511 here. Um, oh, no, I didn't answer the question about char star versus char arrays, did I? That was an interesting one. It might be um, useful if we do, if we don't have time to do that now. The other thing we can do is we can post an answer about it on the forum and try and give a really good detailed answer there. Unless you'd like to give a quick answer now. No, I, I prefer to put an answer on the forum about the difference between a char star and a char array. That would be um, that would be that would be better. All right. Okay. Um, um, so one thing I would want to say uh, before we finish up. And if it's okay, is um, hopefully all of you know that my experience is currently going on. Um, we in one five one one rely on my experience to design the course better to imp make improvements every term. Not only does it help one five one one, but if you give feedback about you know here's something that one five one one did badly, um, Andrew generally doesn't teach one five one one. He normally teaches other courses, so he'll take that feedback back to other places. And certainly we have conversations with all the other first year courses about you know what was good fit what, what was good feedback that we got what should we keep doing what should we do differently so you have an incentive to do my experience not just for the generations of future students who will be thankful to you for 
you telling us what we've done badly or what we could improve, I suppose, um, but also it will make your experience at CSE better if we get your feedback on what we should be doing. So please give my experience feedback. Um, there are links in the tutorial to do that. Uh, yes, that's my promo spot for my experience done. Yeah, so the whole university takes my experience seriously. So as I said, I, I help aggregate the schools, my experience. I read every comment in the whole school and I help the associate dean and deputy dean look at look at the faculty, my experience, and work out what's happening there as well. And a similar process has happens outside the faculty. No, no one fortunately asks me to be involved in that, but it's we, we, we do look at my experience. All right. So there's yeah, there are lots of different directions to go with this, I would say. So yeah, the skills you've got from 151 are portable. So yeah, I would use use some of the time between the, particularly in lockdown Sydney, use some of the time between the exam and the next term to, to explore different directions and, and see you know, see what you've learnt now and what, what interesting things you can play with. Can you code up things? Um, also appreciate what you've learnt. So, as I've said, these things, yeah, students think, oh my God, it took me so much time to learn you know, how loops work and arrays work, but it's that's the same for everyone. And it's, it's so worth knowing and so useful. There's, there's no easy path to these things you've learned the hard way, and they will be useful for you in future. And there's just endless amounts of other things you can learn, but please, after the exams, do not fail maths because you're exploring further in computing. Once last exam's in, you can dive off into all sorts of interesting topics. All right, so yeah, I would strongly and sorry you, you to try and, if you discover you love coding, just figure out how you can take a career path that involves more of the stuff you love. It's, you're fortunate there because it's there are lots of people who will pay you to do interesting things with coding, and so you can work on your what you love and you know earn money to pay for rent, food, that sort of thing. And yeah, and if you haven't loved coding, it's going to be useful to do things that you will love. I hope. Um, so I'm I'm really hopeful that all your hard work on this course pays off. I would say. We're not quite finished, so good luck getting assignment two in. The weekly test doesn't matter much, but good luck finishing off the weekly tests. But especially good luck with the exam. Don't panic, we'll be there on exam day frantically answering everyone's questions. So good luck with the exam as well. All right, so if you, I'll post a, a, a answer on the forum for the difference between a char star and a char array. Which is not, not not a really a core topic. It's something it's not, not sort of useful. And if there are other questions, other fundamental topics, we'll post e examples there. As I've said, we'll have revision classes um, coming up in next week, Tuesday and Wednesday. Tom will post the details of that. I think we're getting a few tutors in. I'm not sure if I'll feel the revision class or not, um, but let us know. All right, so. I think this is the end. Good luck. Thank you all for taking Comp 1511. Uh, I hope to see you. If you're taking Comp 1521 next term, I'll be teaching Comp 1521 next term. You won't see me there. Or if you take Comp 2041 in term two next year, you'll see me there. So I hope to see you in a future course. Oh, I hope to see you on campus too. So if in the future, you're on campus and you come up and say hello in person uh, after our virtual time together. So, introduce yourself. And to all speak right. on behalf of the tutors, I know the tutors have all enjoyed working with all of you. And if you see any of your tutors on campus as well, definitely come up and say hi to them too. It's uh, yeah, we're really sad about you not. Yeah, it's in fact we're more sad about you not meeting your tutors than you are about you not meeting me. Um, so. You definitely, when you come up and say hello to you, thank your tutors who have, the tutors have done an amazing job on the course. And forgive us if we don't recognize you. There was one instance where I saw a student who looked at me and one of my friends who was also a tutor in the course and thought, hold on a second, I know you both. And we realized that they'd been one of our students a few times ago. So our apologies that that happens, but it's been great working with you all. All right. And so good luck, have fun. and. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you on campus in future.
All right. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. I got the timing there completely wrong. Uh, it is in T2 next year. 